the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter five mother mother i am so happy whispered the girl burying her face in the lap of the faded tired-looking woman who with back turned to the shrill intrusive light was sitting in the one armchair that their dingy sitting-room contained i am so happy she repeated and you must be happy too mrs vane winced and put her thin bismuth whitened hands on her daughter's head happy i am only happy sybil when i see you act you must not think of anything but your acting mr isaacs has been very good to us and we owe him money the girl looked up and pouted money mother she cried what does money matter love is more than money mr isaacs has advanced us fifty pounds to pay off our debts and to get a proper outfit for james you must not forget that sybil fifty pounds is a very large sum mr isaacs has been most considerate he is not a gentleman mother and i hate the way he talks to me said the girl rising to her feet and going over to the window i don't know how we could manage without him answered the elder woman querulously sibyl vane tossed her head and laughed we don't want him any more mother prince charming rules life for us now then she paused a rose shook in her blood and shadowed her cheeks quick breath parted the petals of her lips they trembled some southern wind of passion swept over her and stirred the dainty folds of her dress i love him she said simply foolish child foolish child was the parrot phrase flung in answer the waving of crooked false jewelled fingers gave grotesqueness to the words the girl laughed again the joy of a caged bird was in her voice her eyes caught the melody and echoed it in radiance then closed for a moment as though to hide their secret when they opened the mist of a dream had passed across them thin-lipped wisdom spoke at her from the worn chair hinted at prudence quoted from that book of cowardice whose author apes the name of common sense she did not listen she was free in her prison of passion her prince prince charming was with her she had called on memory to remake him she had sent her soul to search for him and it had brought him back his kiss burned again upon her mouth her eyelids were warm with his breath then wisdom altered its method and spoke of espial and discovery this young man might be rich if so marriage should be thought of against the shell of her ear broke the waves of worldly cunning the arrows of craft shot by her she saw the thin lips moving and smiled suddenly she felt the need to speak the wordy silence troubled her mother mother she cried why does he love me so much i know why i love him i love him because he is like what love himself should be but what does he see in me i am not worthy of him and yet why i cannot tell though i feel so much beneath him i don't feel humble i feel proud terribly proud mother did you love my father as i love prince charming the elder woman grew pale beneath the coarse powder that daubed her cheeks and her dry lips twitched with a spasm of pain sibyl rushed to her flung her arms round her neck and kissed her forgive me mother i know it pains you to talk about our father but it only pains you because you loved him so much don't look sad i am as happy today as you were twenty years ago ah let me be happy forever my child you are far too young to think of falling in love besides what do you know of this young man 
You don't even know his name. The whole thing is most inconvenient. And really, when James is going away to Australia and I have so much to think of, I must say that you should have shown more consideration. However, as I said before, if he is rich... Ah, oh, mother, mother, let me be happy. Mrs. Vane glanced at her, and with one of those false theatrical gestures that so often become a mode of second nature to a stage player, clasped her in her arms. At this moment the door opened, and a young lad with rough brown hair came into the room. He was thick-set of figure, and his hands and feet were large and somewhat clumsy in movement. He was not so finely bred as his sister. One would hardly have guessed the close relationship that existed between them. Mrs. Vane fixed her eyes on him and intensified her smile. She mentally elevated her son to the dignity of an audience. She felt sure that the tableau was interesting. "'You might keep some of your kisses for me, Sybil, I think,' said the lad with a good-natured grumble. Ah, but you don't like being kissed, Jim, she cried. You are a dreadful old bear. And she ran across the room and hugged him. James Vane looked into his sister's face with tenderness. I want you to come out with me for a walk, Sybil. I don't suppose I shall ever see this horrid London again. I am sure I don't want to. My son, don't say such dreadful things murmured mrs vane taking up a tawdry theatrical dress with a sigh and beginning to patch it she felt a little disappointed that he had not joined the group it would have increased the theatrical picturesqueness of the situation why not mother i mean it you pain me my son i trust you will return from australia in a position of affluence I believe there is no society of any kind in the colonies, nothing that I would call society. So when you have made your fortune, you must come back and assert yourself in London. Society, muttered the lad. I don't want to know anything about that. I should like to make some money to take you and Sybil off the stage. I hate it. Oh, Jim, said Sybil, laughing. How unkind of you. But are you really going for a walk with me? That will be nice. I was afraid you were going to say good-bye to some of your friends. To Tom Hardy, who gave you that hideous pipe. Or Ned Langton, who makes fun of you for smoking it. It is very sweet of you to let me have your last afternoon. Where shall we go? Let us go to the park. I am too shabby. Only swell people go to the park. Nonsense, Jim. She whispered, stroking the sleeve of his coat. He hesitated for a moment. Very well, he said at last. But don't be too long dressing. She danced out of the door. One could hear her singing as she ran upstairs. Her little feet pattered overhead. He walked up and down the room two or three times. Then he turned to the still figure in the chair. Mother, are my things ready? He asked. Quite ready, James, she answered, keeping her eyes on her work. For some months past she had felt ill at ease when she was alone with this rough, stern son of hers. Her shallow, secret nature was troubled when their eyes met. She used to wonder if he suspected anything. The silence, for he made no other observation, became intolerable to her. She began to complain. Women defend themselves by attacking, just as they attack by sudden and strange surrenders. I hope you will be contented, James, with your seafaring life, she said. You must remember that it is your own choice. You might have entered a solicitor's office. Solicitors are a very respectable class, and in the country often dine with the best families. I hate offices, and I hate clerks, he replied. But you are quite right. I have chosen my own life. All I say is, watch over Sybil. Don't let her come to any harm. Mother, you must watch over her. James, you really talk very strangely. Of course I watch over Sybil. I hear a gentleman comes every night to the theatre and goes behind to talk to her. Is that right? 
What about that? You are speaking about things you don't understand, James. In the profession, we are accustomed to receive a great deal of most gratifying attention. I myself used to receive many bouquets at one time. That was when acting was really understood. As for Sybil, I do not know at present whether her attachment is serious or not. But there is no doubt that the young man in question is a perfect gentleman. He is always most polite to me. Besides, he has the appearance of being rich, and the flowers he sends are lovely. You don't know his name, though, said the lad harshly. No, answered his mother with a placid expression in her face. He has not yet revealed his real name. I think it is quite romantic of him. He is probably a member of the aristocracy. James Vane bit his lip. Watch over Sybil, mother, he cried. Watch over her. My son, you distress me very much. Sybil is always under my special care. Of course, if this gentleman is wealthy, there is no reason why she should not contract an alliance with him. I trust he is one of the aristocracy. He has all the appearance of it, I must say. It might be a most brilliant marriage for Sybil. They would make a charming couple. His good looks are really quite remarkable. Everybody notices them. The lad muttered something to himself and drummed on the window pane with his coarse fingers. He had just turned round to say something when the door opened and Sybil ran in. How serious you both are! She cried. What is the matter? Nothing, he answered. I suppose one must be serious sometimes. Good bye, mother. I will have my dinner at five o'clock. Everything is packed. Except my shirts, so you need not trouble. Good bye, my son, she answered with a bow of strained stateliness. She was extremely annoyed at the tone he had adopted with her, and there was something in his look that made her feel afraid. Kiss me, mother, said the girl. Her flower like lips touched the withered cheek and warmed its frost. My child. My child, cried Mrs. Vane, looking up to the ceiling in search of an imaginary gallery. Come, Sybil, said her brother impatiently. He hated his mother's affectations. They went out into the flickering wind blown sunlight and strolled down the dreary Euston Road. The passers-by glanced in wonder at the sullen, heavy youth, who in coarse, ill-fitting clothes was in the company of such a graceful, refined-looking girl. He was like a common gardener walking with a rose. Jim frowned from time to time when he caught the inquisitive glance of some stranger. He had that dislike of being stared at which comes on geniuses late in life, and never leaves the commonplace. Sybil, however, was quite unconscious of the effect she was producing. Her love was trembling in laughter on her lips. She was thinking of Prince Charming, and that she might think of him all the more, she did not talk of him, but prattled on about the ship in which Jim was going to sail about the gold he was certain to find, about the wonderful heiress whose life he was to save from the wicked red-shirted bushrangers. For he was not going to remain a sailor, or a supercargo, or whatever he was going to be. Oh, no! A sailor's existence was dreadful. Fancy being cooped up in a horrid ship, with the hoarse, humpbacked waves trying to get in, and a black wind blowing the masts down and tearing the sails into long screaming ribbons. He was to leave the vessel at Melbourne, bid a polite good-bye to the captain, and go off at once to the gold fields. Before a week was over he was to come across a large nugget of pure gold, the largest nugget that had ever been discovered and bring it down to the coast in a wagon guarded by six mounted policemen. The bushrangers were to attack them three times, and be defeated with immense slaughter. 
or no he was not to go to the goldfields at all they were horrid places where men got intoxicated and shot each other in bar-rooms and used bad language he was to be a nice sheep farmer and one evening as he was riding home he was to see the beautiful heiress being carried off by a robber on a black horse and give chase and, and rescue her of course she would fall in love with him and he with her and they would get married and come home and live in an immense house in london yes there were delightful things in store for him but he must be very good and not lose his temper or spend his money foolishly she was only a year older than he was but she knew so much more of life he must be sure also to write to her by every mail and to say his prayers each night before he went to sleep god was very good and would watch over him she would pray for him too and in a few years he would come back quite rich and happy the lad listened sulkily to her and made no answer he was heart-sick at leaving home yet it was not this alone that made him gloomy and morose inexperienced though he was he had still a strong sense of the danger of sibyl's position this young dandy who was making love to her could mean her no good he was a gentleman and he hated him for that hated him through some curious race instinct for which he could not account and which for that reason was all the more dominant within him he was conscious also of the shallowness and vanity of his mother's nature and in that saw infinite peril for sibyl and sibyl's happiness children begin by loving their parents as they grow older they judge them sometimes they forgive them his mother he had something on his mind to ask of her something that he had brooded on for many months of silence a chance phrase that he had heard at the theatre a whispered sneer that had reached his ears one night as he waited at the stage door had set loose a train of horrible thoughts he remembered it as if it had been the lash of a hunting crop across his face his brows knit together into a wedge-like furrow and with a twitch of pain he bit his underlip you are not listening to a word i am saying jim cried sibyl and i am making the most delightful plans for your future do say something what do you want me to say oh that you will be a good boy and not forget us she answered smiling at him he shrugged his shoulders you are more likely to forget me than i am to forget you sibyl she flushed what do you mean jim she asked you have a new friend i hear who is he why have you not told me about him he means you no good stop jim she exclaimed you must not say anything against him i love him why you don't even know his name answered the lad who is he i have a right to know he is called prince charming don't you like the name oh you silly boy you should never forget it if you only saw him you would think him the most wonderful person in the world some day you will meet him when you come back from australia you will like him so much everybody likes him and i love him i wish you could come to the theatre tonight he is going to be there and i am to play juliet oh how i shall play it fancy jim to be in love and play juliet to have him sitting there to play for his delight i am afraid i may frighten the company frighten or enthrall them to be in love is to surpass oneself poor dreadful mr isaacs will be shouting genius to his loafers at the bar he has preached me as a dogma tonight he will announce me as a revelation i feel it and it is all his his only prince charming my wonderful lover my god of graces but i am poor beside him poor what does that matter when poverty creeps in at the door love flies in through the window 
our proverbs want rewriting. They were made in winter, and it is summer now. Springtime for me, I think, a very dance of blossoms and blue skies. He is a gentleman, said the lad sullenly. A prince, she cried musically. What more do you want? He wants to enslave you. I shudder at the thought of being free. I want you to be aware of him. To see him is to worship him. To know him is to trust him. Sybil, you are mad about him. She laughed and took his arm. You dear old Jim, you talk as if you were a hundred. Some day you will be in love yourself. Then you will know what it is. Don't look so sulky. Surely you should be glad to think that, though you are going away, you leave me happier than I have ever been before. Life has been hard for us both, terribly hard and difficult. But it will be different now. You are going to a new world, and I have found one. Here are two chairs. Let us sit down and see the smart people go by. They took their seats amidst a crowd of watchers. The tulip beds across the road flamed like throbbing rings of fire. A white dust, tremulous cloud of orris root, it seemed, hung in the panting air. The brightly coloured parasols danced and dipped like monstrous butterflies. She made her brother talk of himself, his hopes, his prospects. He spoke slowly and with effort. They passed words to each other as players at a game pass counters. Sibyl felt oppressed. She could not communicate her joy. A faint smile curving that sullen mouth was all the echo she could win. After some time she became silent. Suddenly she caught a glimpse of golden hair and laughing lips, and in an open carriage with two ladies, Dorian Gray drove past. She started to her feet. There he is, she cried. Who? said Jim Vane. Prince Charming, she answered, looking after the Victoria. He jumped up and seized her roughly by the arm. Show him to me. Which is he? Point him out. I must see him, he exclaimed. But at that moment the Duke of Berwick's four in hand came between, and when it had left the space clear, the carriage had swept out of the park. He is gone, murmured Sibyl sadly. I wish you had seen him. I wish I had, for as sure as there is a God in heaven, if he ever does you anything wrong, I shall kill him. She looked at him in horror. He repeated his words. They cut the air like a dagger. The people round began to gape. A lady standing close to her tittered. Come away, Jim. Come away, she whispered. He followed her doggedly as she passed through the crowd. He felt glad at what he had said. When they reached the Achilles statue, she turned round. There was pity in her eyes that became laughter on her lips. She shook her head at him. You are foolish, Jim, utterly foolish, a bad-tempered boy, that is all. How can you say such horrible things? You don't know what you are talking about. You are simply jealous and unkind. <laughs> I wish you would fall in love. Love makes people good, and what you said was wicked. I am sixteen, he answered, and I know what I am about. Mother is no help to you. She doesn't understand how to look after you. I wish now that I was not going to Australia at all. I have a great mind to chuck the whole thing up. I would, if my articles hadn't been signed. Oh, don't be so serious, Jim. You were like one of the heroes of those silly melodramas Mother used to be so fond of acting in. I am not going to quarrel with you. I have seen him, and, oh, to see him is perfect happiness. We won't quarrel. I know you would never harm anyone I love, would you? Not as long as you love him, I suppose, was the sullen answer. I shall love him forever, she cried. And he? Forever, too. He had better. She shrank from him. Then she laughed and put her hand on his arm. He was merely a boy. At the marble arch they hailed an omnibus, which left them close to their shabby home in the Euston Road. It was after five o'clock, and Sybil had to lie down for a couple of hours before acting. 
jim insisted that she should do so he said that he would sooner part with her when their mother was not present she would be sure to make a scene and he detested scenes of every kind in sibyl's own room they parted there was jealousy in the lad's heart and a fierce murderous hatred of the stranger who as it seemed to him had come between them yet when her arms were flung round his neck and her fingers strayed through his hair he softened and kissed her with real affection there were tears in his eyes as he went downstairs his mother was waiting for him below she grumbled at his unpunctuality as he entered he made no answer but sat down to his meagre meal the flies buzzed round the table and crawled over the stained cloth through the rumble of omnibuses and the clatter of street cabs he could hear the droning voice devouring each minute that was left to him after some time he thrust away his plate and put his head in his hands he felt that he had a right to know it should have been told to him before if it was as he suspected leaden with fear his mother watched him words dropped mechanically from her lips a tattered lace handkerchief twitched in her fingers when the clock struck six he got up and went to the door then he turned back and looked at her their eyes met in hers he saw a wild appeal for mercy it enraged him mother i have something to ask you he said her eyes wandered vaguely about the room she made no answer tell me the truth i have a right to know were you married to my father she heaved a deep sigh it was a sigh of relief the terrible moment the moment that night and day for weeks and months she had dreaded had come at last and yet she felt no terror indeed in some measure it was a disappointment to her the vulgar directness of the question called for a direct answer the situation had not been gradually led up to it was crude it reminded her of a bad rehearsal no she answered wondering at the harsh simplicity of life my father was a scoundrel then cried the lad clenching his fists she shook her head i knew he was not free we loved each other very much if he had lived he would have made provision for us don't speak against him my son he was your father and a gentleman indeed he was highly connected an oath broke from his lips i don't care for myself he exclaimed but don't let sybil it is a gentleman isn't it who is in love with her or says he is highly connected too i suppose for a moment a hideous sense of humiliation came over the woman her head drooped she wiped her eyes with shaking hands sybil has a mother she murmured i had none the lad was touched he went towards her and stooping down he kissed her i am sorry if i have pained you to ask you about my father he said but i could not help it i must go now good-bye don't forget that you will have only one child now to look after and believe me that if this man wrongs my sister i will find out who he is track him down and kill him like a dog i swear it the exaggerated folly of the threat the passionate gesture that accompanied it the mad melodramatic words made life seem more vivid to her she was familiar with the atmosphere she breathed more freely and for the first time for many months she really admired her son she would have liked to have continued the scene on the same emotional scale but he cut her short trunks had to be carried down and mufflers looked for the lodging-house drudge bustled in and out there was the bargaining with the cabman the moment was lost in vulgar details 
it was with a renewed feeling of disappointment that she waved the tattered lace handkerchief from the window as her son drove away she was conscious that a great opportunity had been wasted she consoled herself by telling sibyl how desolate she felt her life would be now that she had only one child to look after she remembered the phrase it had pleased her of the threat she said nothing it was vividly and dramatically expressed she felt that they would all laugh at it some day End of chapter 5